2,000 years ago, a writer in ancient Rome asked a question for which we still need an answer. The writer was juvenile, and the question was, who will guard the guards? He was asking how the emperor could trust his guards. This question has application to health and medicine also. What protects the body from its armies? And one of the most powerful armies we have is the immune system. When the immune system functions well, it deploys a variety of mechanisms to protect against deadly threats, such as invading microbes and cellular debris. But what happens when the immune system goes rogue and the guards attack the body they're meant to defend? This is the essence of autoimmune disease, and it happens more frequently than many recognize. Approximately 10% of the population suffers from some form of autoimmune disorder. So to paraphrase Juvenile, how can we ensure that the immune system protects and doesn't harm us? As always, when solving a problem, one needs to understand its cause. So we need to ask how and when the immune system goes off track. So let's begin with the healthy immune system. The healthy immune system functions as a green sanitation system and removes cellular debris in a non-inflammatory fashion. The healthy immune system also targets and eradicates microbes such as bacteria and viruses without targeting those microbial structures that are also present in host tissue. But sometimes the sanitation system and the smart targeting system fails. When that happens, the immune system mounts an inflammatory response in a healthy host and damages healthy host tissue. Lupus is a dramatic example of this. Lupus is an autoimmune disease that affects women nine times more often than men. It also affects African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians more often than individuals of Northern European ancestry. Lupus has genetic causes and environmental triggers. Interestingly, some of the genes that predispose to lupus protect against severe malaria infection. I became interested in lupus when I was a medical student. I went to medical school during the era of the Vietnam War. Pogo, a popular cartoon character of the day, famously said, we have met the enemy and he is us. How ironic that what was true of our national politic is also true of autoimmunity. There was also a wave of feminism sweeping the country at the time, and I was fascinated by Southern women authors like Eudora Welty and Flannery O'Connor and Carson McCullers. Autoimmunity touched even these literary circles. Both Flannery O'Connor and Carson McCullers had an autoimmune disease, and notably, Carson McCullers had lupus. I became a physician scientist because I was too impatient to wait for others to take us through an impasse in our understanding of disease mechanisms or how best to treat disease. In some small way, I had to contribute to new knowledge, and the disease I chose to study was, of course, lupus. Lupus is characterized by autoantibodies that target and damage skin and kidney and heart and blood vessels and more. But lupus patients also complain of problems with memory and executive function. Patients call this a lupus fog, and they can experience excessive anxiety or depression. These symptoms were long ignored. My laboratory and our collaborators decided to take these symptoms seriously, and that was a critical first step. 
because we listened to our patients. We asked whether the antibodies that cause problems in other tissues in the body might also be affecting uh, cognition in patients and causing emotional volatility. And we discovered that indeed they were. In fact, one lupus patient told us that she could no longer recognize the block she lived on from a block away. And we were able to show that lupus autoantibodies can cause a selective impairment in map making. These antibodies don't always cause problems, and that's because we have a blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier keeps substances in the circulation from penetrating brain tissue. But there are conditions that are characterized by a leaky blood-brain barrier, and these include infection and stress and smoking and hypertension. And when the blood-brain barrier is leaky, antibodies can leave the circulation, penetrate the brain, and damage neural circuitry. We also learned that lupus anti-brain antibodies could harm a developing fetal brain. This is because antibodies routinely leave maternal circulation and enter the fetal circulation. The fetus has an immature blood-brain barrier that doesn't exclude antibodies from entering brain tissue. So if a woman a pregnant woman has anti-brain antibodies. They will leave her circulation, enter the fetal circulation, enter the fetal brain, where they can impair brain development and cause lifelong problems in cognition. So there were two important outcomes of these observations. First, we learned that antibodies can affect cognition and behavior in an adult and can affect a developing fetal brain. Lupus is the tip of the iceberg. Anti-brain antibodies exist in other autoimmune diseases, in infectious diseases, and in other conditions. They often function in a sneak attack. So unlike in lupus, where they're also targeting skin and kidney, often they target only the brain. So individuals that harbor these antibodies don't know they're present until they have a condition with a leaky blood-brain barrier or until a pregnant woman has an offspring with some cognitive impairment. In fact, up to 10% of cases of autism spectrum disorder have maternal antibodies as a contributing cause. The other important outcome was this knowledge leads to prevention strategies. And one obvious prevention strategy is a deflection strategy using decoy antigens. So let me explain what I mean. If you're holding a basketball in one hand, you can't also hold a volleyball in that hand. So if a anti-brain antibody is entangled with a decoy antigen, it can't also bind to and harm brain tissue. So now we had good news and bad news. The good news was that we had a mechanistic understanding for some of the neuropsychiatric uh, symptoms that lupus patients complain of. The bad news was it seemed a daunting task to tell patients that the antibodies that were harming their skin and their kidneys and other organs might also harm their brain and even the brain of their fetus. This is where we had a big surprise. Amazingly, patients were gratified to hear a scientific explanation of their symptoms. They were relieved to have their reality validated and to know that their symptoms would no longer be trivialized or lead to a referral to a psychiatrist. So not only were we able to learn that there are antibodies that can alter cognition and behavior, both in an adult and in a developing brain, 
And not only were we able to envision prevention strategies to prevent damage from these antibodies, but we had also empowered patients. We had made them realize that they understood aspects of their disease even better than their physicians and that they could trust their own perceptions. So there's a larger lesson here, one that goes beyond lupus and beyond autoimmunity. The lesson is when we ignore our patients, when we don't listen to what they're telling us, we risk throwing away some of the most important clues to understanding disease. And this may be especially true of brain disease. But when we listen to our patients, when we make them our partners, not only in treatment, but also in research, then we can answer that vexing 2,000-year-old question. Who will guard the guards? We will, all of us, by working together. Thank you.